Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lello. And it's going to just be the three of us this week. We are going to be answering some questions from Twitter and our inbox. So hopefully should be some good stuff. We'll be talking there quite a few about pre-orders, uh, rapid release, what to do between rapid releases to keep books selling, and um, some more basic how to find a good editor and what to do about uh, healthcare and stuff like that. Um, so we have a really big list of questions, so we may, this may become a two-parter. We shall see how it goes. <laughs> I, I think we're all kind of a little tired tonight, or at least I am, so we might not make it for an hour and a half long show. Um, but before we get started with the questions, do you guys have any news that you would like to share? I'll get started with that. Um, I have a short novel called The Story of Sorrel that's gone to the editor, and it already has cover art. I'm probably not going to do a long like pre-order or anything like this. I'm probably just going to put it out because it was not a planned release. It's sort of a bonus release for this year. Um, so that's good. Uh, might be out by the end of this month, more likely sometime in April. And I'm also 50 some odd thousand words into my second urban fantasy story. I'm going to be writing three of these and doing a rapid release, hopefully this summer. So I'm sort of on track for that. Um, and also... It's funny, I saw a tweet about this, uh, and they, did, they could not have known that this was in my news, but the ball has started rolling again on a piece of merchandise I've been working on for over a year. <laughs> been working on is, is tough because I only worked on it for a month or so, and then it's just been sort of stuck in development for a while. But I'm just going to say what it is because it might never happen, and at least somebody will know. Uh, I'm having coins made. They're supposed to be the currency from one of my fantasy books. And the idea is just for it to be a cool thing to give to people. But I'm going to have them for sale on my site and stuff like that. Just regular old, they're called campaign coins. If you want to do a search for campaign coins, uh, that's the name of the company that makes them. They're, they're meant to be used for, for Dungeons and Dragons games. But I thought they were cool giveaway items. And they've, they've worked with authors before. So we'll see if that comes to fruition. But... You've got me thinking of when I was in the army and like the first sergeants and uh, actually maybe Challenge like coins. the battalion commanders would hand out a coin if you did a good job. Yep. You'd be that guy at the cons. It's like, yeah, you did a good job. Here's a Joe Lalo coin. I want to have a pocket full of them. And then like for a while I was, I was going to be like, the only way you can get these is if you meet me somewhere because then there'd only be like seven of them in the wild. <laughs> but yeah, that's the merch that I'm working on. And that's it. That's my, my news. All right. As for me, first and foremost, hey, man, that sounds really cool. I'm going to look into that right as we speak. As I think every author would love to see like coins of whatever currency they've got created and actually physically in person, but I think that's cool. Um, as for me, my sixth mystery is out. Um, I'm, not, I'm back to work wrapping up my latest fantasy trilogy. Um, if with that, I'm more than halfway through, so that should be done sometime soon. Then I'm going to be shifting gears and trying a new genre, dark fantasy. I'm um, taking a short story that I wrote a while back and I've had enough interest in it where I'm going to turn it into a full length novel. Uh, let's see. Another mystery audiobook is in the works. That's about it for me. You must be doing well enough with the mysteries to uh, keep encouraged to write more. If you're up to number six, uh, how, how's it compared? Yeah, to I, I, I never would have, I never would have imagined that, but yeah, it just, I have, I, I keep dropping like little, little hints, not really, to you know little but just like you know, things here and there i got people asking me well when's this going to happen when are you going to deal with that when are you going to deal with that i'm like all right yeah, it's it's selling just as well as my fantasy so why not keep it going all right cool well i'm not sure my news is a whole lot different than um the last time we did a just a show i finished up my chains of honor series um just the fourth one now i'm going over the edits that my editor just sent back so as soon as i get cover art i'll get that out got the third one out last month so i'm happy to get in this was an older series that i had abandoned <laughs> for about three years and with a horrible cliffhanger ending too i felt really bad about it so i am pleased even if it was never a huge money maker to have completed this story arc and i actually uh, enjoyed the last two stories better than I thought I would when I was like dreading having to go back and like reread the old ones and get back into that world that I hadn't touched. So that's good. I, I think the readers like the third one and I think they should like the fourth one. So, uh, and while my editor had that, I started um, the first one in a new sci-fi series I've been talking about and I've just about done with the rough draft of the first one. 
think it'll end up being around 90,000 words in the end. And I'm going to do what Joe's doing with this urban fantasy probably and hold the first three. And I'm going to shoot for May is my release month, which is not that far away. So I had to write two and three pretty quickly. But um, that's all I have on the slate right now. So that would be good. And we shall see because it's been a couple years now since I released uh, into sci-fi with a, a big series. So I guess three years ago, I did my Fallen Empire series. So we'll see how much more competitive it is, how much it's changed. You know, it's, it seems like stuff changes every month on here. And I've been a little checked out this winter since I was just working on old stuff and not worrying too much about what the latest Amazon algorithms are doing. Although I saw something today or this week while I was buying some books that uh, – where the also bots used to be, it had something like recommendations. Have you guys seen that yet? And it was, I actually, it had like three books I just bought in the recommendations. So it seemed completely useless <laughs> in compared to what we had before. Have you guys seen that yet? I personally haven't noticed it, but now that you've mentioned it, I got to go check it out to see, <laughs> see what it's going to recommend to me. I have noticed that the area, I didn't even really notice that it was not also bots. Uh, I just have noticed that that section of the screen does tend to contain basically the last two books I bought along with a bunch of others. So yeah, it's kind of a curious change to make. Yeah, I mean, there were a couple in there I could see checking out. They were like related, same genre. Um, but also I, I actually powered through like four books on my vacation, which has been rare for me lately. I read on um, Miranda Han Fleur. Oh boy, it's a dark elf standalone fantasy romance that she wrote. I forgot the name, No Man Can Tame or something. I think that's it. It's not quite as uh, racy and uh, explicit as that title maybe makes it sound. Miranda, I know you're listening, so <laughs> we can discuss titles later if you want. But um, So I enjoyed that. You guys should check that out. She was a guest on the show last year. And I'm also reading an older series. Um, it's called The Lunar Chronicles. It's, it starts with a Cinderella sci-fi story where the Cinderella is a cyborg. So that's what drew me into it. It's kind of YA, but I mean, it is YA, but I usually don't like YA and I've been enjoying these. I just started the fourth one. So if you guys need something to read, you can check those out. Um, and if we don't have any more news, we can jump into the questions. Sound good to you guys? Sounds good to me. Let's do it. All right. The first question is from Dre. Dr. Dre, for rapid release for a five book series, would you recommend the time gap between releases be two, three, or four weeks? And for somebody using it to rebuild their readership, would you recommend Amazon marketing ads on the first book to help train Amazon algorithms? You guys want to answer first? Sure. Um, again, I haven't done a rapid release officially, uh, but I've obviously been paying attention to what people say. My opinion on it and what I plan to do with mine is uh, I like the idea of for the bulk of the series, even though I'm only doing three, but for the bulk of the series, I think four weeks, you don't want to go longer than four weeks, but I, I like four weeks between most of the books because it extends the amount of time you're doing the releases and therefore reduces the amount of time before the next release you do. Like you'll have more time to write the next stuff. But you might want to do a shorter one just for the first between the first two books, like so, like two weeks between books one and two, and then four weeks thereafter. And as for the advertising, uh, yes, uh, absolutely, I think you should probably do some sort of ads to to get things rolling on the first book. As for me, I've never actually done a rapid release, um, but if I were to try one, you know, based on what Joe is saying, that listening to what other people have done, I would probably have a a four week, you know interval between the, the books there just to help start building momentum and you definitely want to do some sort of advertising whether with amazon try your hand with you know, facebook or maybe even try with bookbub but you want to do something in my case i have done the rapid release probably four or five times now um, at least with the first three books I've uh, I've done one week apart for the first three, and I, I actually did that with the last series, and I felt it was a little too close. Like, there wasn't enough time for the majority of the people to have gotten through the first book before the second book was already there, and I, I've done it in the past with a two-week gap in between, and I, I like that. I think for the first three books, I'll probably do that for my next series. Um, the only thing where, if you're going a week apart or even dropping them all on the same day, um, you're... If you can sell well enough, your odds are better of getting some of the KDP all-star bonuses, if that's what you're doing, if you're trying to get a whole lot of page reads in a month. And uh, I've done that in the past, and I try to do like the releases in the second half of the month prior to the one where I'm hoping 
to get enough reads for the, some of the bonuses. And I, I usually have, even though most of my stuff is wide, if you have like one series that's selling well, uh, you know, and it's probably gonna have to be in the top two or 300 on Amazon and have a couple books like that. Uh, maybe up in the top 500 to make it. It gets harder all the time, but I, I think I made it with like 5,000, uh, no, 5,000, 5 million page reads total for an author bonus. I've heard it's three or four now for an individual book bonus. Um, I often will get them in the UK and Germany uh, for longer. Like I'll continue to get them usually for a couple months if the series is doing okay. Um, so that's one reason why you might want to cram them closer together, but by doing it a little farther apart, you have longer time where you have potentially a title and the hot new releases and um, you know so I, I don't know I like about two weeks apart and then if you can do like about a month apart afterwards that's awesome a lot of people myself included even if you write fast sometimes it can be a challenge just to get the cover art and the editing and if you do beta readers you know you have to be a little factory producing books to to keep them rolling that fast but usually if the first three books kind of caught on and are continuing to sell uh, with Amazon's help. <laughs> um, and I haven't had as much success with the rapid release in the other stores, although I usually just drop them all at once when they come out of KU and I go wide. Um, so that's why I'm mentioning Amazon specifically. But um, yeah, if you can get the first three to a real solid start, that will often, you can kind of coast after that. And there's not as much pressure to get that fourth and fifth book out so quickly. But so that's that thought. And um, as far as Amazon ads, oh yes. I have been trying to start that. I'll put up a pre-order for book one like a week or two ahead of time and start running ads on that without actually telling anyone that the book is on pre-order. Because um, in my case, my, my lists are mixed. I have sci-fi fantasy and sci-fi romance under another name. And a lot of my readers know all the names and buy everything, which is awesome. But as we've talked about on the show before, that can kind of mess up the also bots if there's still going to be a factor i'm assuming there's still a factor i don't know uh what amazon is going to shake out if they're getting rid of those or not but um the more people in your tight little genre you have like military sci-fi specifically buying your book the more it's going to show up under other military sci-fi books and the more likely you're going to do well uh, when you've got a broader people broader spectrum of people it might be a little more confusing and uh, so as far as Amazon knowing who to send emails to, like, hey, hey, there's a new military sci-fi book you might want to see. So if you can do the Amazon ads and just target military sci-fi, if that's your genre, then that might be helpful. I, I for good or ill, I have people that just kind of seem to watch all the time and they know when I put something up, whether I've said anything about it or not. So I've kind of given up on myself <laughs> having that work. But uh, if I started a pen name, I would keep it silent for a little while and do that. All right, next question. Nicole asks, people always ask about rapid release, but never about what happens between series release cycles. As they're stockpiling new titles, I assume there are months where nothing new is up, depending on how long it takes for them to write. Algorithm cliff chaos, discuss. <laughs> you guys go first. Uh, all right, so the time between rapid releases is basically uh, the same as the time between normal releases for people who are on a slower release cycle. Uh, so the rules is like basically are what, what I do for a living, which is uh, if you use advertising dollars, you use the advertising dollars to direct people back to the start of the series, either the most recent series or the most successful series or all of your series if you have multiple. Uh, and then just try to keep your readers engaged on your platform of choice, either your newsletter or your newsletter and social media. Just sort of keeping them up on the fact that there's more books coming and, and you know, uh, giving them little tidbits along the way so that when the time comes for the next set of releases, they're, you know, hungry and raring to go. So that's what I say. Yeah, exactly. You want to, you want, you want to pull in as many new readers as, into the series as possible. Focus advertising on the first in the series, especially if you have multiple series. And even consider making that title, if you haven't already, make it perma-free. Right. Um, you will. This is kind of what I'm dealing with right now. I finished my last series, I, Agents of the Crown. I published at the end of November or first week of December, I think. And because I shifted over to finish this other series that has zero momentum at this point, and I haven't even advertised the first one. I tried to get a book bug and they shot it down. So <laughs> uh, it's going to be, like I said, May until I get a new series out. So that's like a six month gap and like a new series that I can really throw a lot uh, behind. So that, and that's what a lot of people face if they stop to write three novels. I mean, it could even be a year. 
So part of the thing is if you're going to do this strategy, you really got to put a lot in a lot of effort into the launch of that original. You should be like the three rapid release books. And if you've, once you finish the series, I mean, I would probably be working on the next series before book six, the final book in the last series drops so that you can keep it going. Or you just have to accept, like hopefully you made enough during those months that, that you were selling well. Hopefully that's the, what we hope from the rapid release. That um, things are, you know, I, and I can only speak in my case, it doesn't drop off entirely, uh, especially if I leave stuff in KU, there's like a longer period where it coasts a little downhill, but it doesn't go away entirely and you'll see a lot of people still continuing to advertise their early books like throwing a lot of money in it if they're making more than they're spending so because there, there's stuff out there that i i go check the top 100 is like what, what's in sci-fi romance i haven't been there for like a year and it's the same you know 10 books are in the top 20 that were there you know a year ago because the authors are presumably spending a lot on advertising and presumably making enough that it makes sense to do that uh, you'll probably figure it out pretty early on if your series has legs and it's, if, if it's worth putting a lot of money into it. I, I usually don't. I don't have anything running on AMS right now. I, I had to change credit card numbers, so they stopped with the two or three I had running, and I just haven't gone back and set it up. But um, like the guys were saying, too, if you just plan a few sales in that in-between period, too, when you don't have any new releases, if you can get a book bub, that's always awesome. I was lucky I had, like, two on my box sets. My, my free box sets in this time. And that's always good, especially that gives me a big boost on the non Amazon sites. But even if you can't get book love, there are a lot of sites and you can do various things, you know, plan a group promo with other offers. Lots, you know, we've had lots of guests on talking about that stuff. So I would just accept that maybe one day when you're working on the new stuff uh, every month, plan, put something together to try to keep the old stuff selling. Okay, H-E asks, since everyone is asking about rapid release, how long should you advertise or pre-launch the series before you rapid release the books? Also, where does most of your traffic for book, for book buying come from? Is it the mailing list? Uh, I think that's like, where does most of your sales come from? You guys wanna chime in first? Yep, um, okay, so I'm most active on Twitter, but the biggest direct punch for a release is always from the newsletter for me, followed by Facebook. So even though those are number two and number three in terms of activity, they're number one and number two in terms of, of income. Uh, I'd recommend a long, steady build uh, to a release with social media type stuff in terms of actually spending money on advertising before release. I'd probably keep to the, the month of the release. Like if you're spending money, uh, you want it to be closer to the release, if not the week of release. Uh, certainly after the pre-order link is, is handy, obviously. And, uh, you know, you can extend that out a little bit if you've got like a prequel novella or something that you can advertise so that they can get to that. And then when, by the time they're through reading that, we're closer to release time. But you want to focus your, your, your money on driving traffic to close to the release date as possible. Yes, I mean, I, I haven't done any rapid releases, but for my normal book titles or book launches, I predominantly use uh, Facebook, you know, to build up the hype. I use my newsletter, just like Joe. I'm, that's number one and number two for me. Uh, as for advertising a new release, I'd give it a week, maybe two before release date. I wouldn't try to do anything longer than that. I will definitely kind of talk up something new that I'm working on and share snippets on Facebook. So in a way, I'm doing it as soon as I'm working on it, which may be like in the sci-fi series here, it may still be a couple months from release, but I, if I write something that makes me laugh, I share it with them and then maybe they're getting a little bit excited. I've never been one for cover, cover reveals, I guess, cause I'm just underwhelmed by this activity as a reader myself. I, covers never do much for me, but if you have a really awesome cover, um, that's something you can do. As far as like, um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is part of the question, but if you're wondering how long of a pre-order you should do and how much effort you should go into advertising that pre-order, I've seen a couple of people say lately that they've had pretty good success with the longer pre-orders, even on Amazon, but those people also have really big audiences. So uh, it may be limited success. You know, if you're pretty new and people aren't actually out there Google or Amazoning, Amazoning your name, is that a... a proper verb there. <laughs> um, that may have limited use. I use, I'm still doing only about a week or two maybe for the pre-orders when I launch a new series and that's basically so I can get the link to give if I'm going to try to get like e-reader news today or whoever else will advertise a new release. 
so I can get the link to give to them and also so the also bots which <laughs> may or may not continue to be a thing will populate people will start to buy it because you may have noticed if you release a book and just announce it you don't even have like a, a sales ranking often you don't have the category stuff filled in it seems to take three or four days for Amazon to get all that stuff onto the sales page um, so that's why I do it I wouldn't spend a lot of money advertising a pre-order. You know, we mentioned that you can do it. I, I spent only a little bit when I did that. I did that with Fractured Stars, just trying to get the right audience that, you know, kind of that was kind of a sci-fi space opera, sci-fi romance audience for that one um, to try to get them in the also bots. But because it's a pre-order, you cannot get KU set borrows yet. So you're advertising only to people that are willing to pay full price. And if you have a, you know, those people may fall through, their credit card may not go through. So, you know, it's like, how much work do you actually want to, how much do you want to pay to get those? I would, I would just do a little bit, like maybe $5 a day or something on AMS ads for um, a new book one. And for what most of my sales come from, uh, the, the mailing list is definitely the biggest all at one punch. Uh, with Facebook, I'll do a boosted post to my Facebook audience, and that will be my second all at once punch. I kind of alternate. So usually I do the Facebook po post. <laughs> Speaking is difficult. The Facebook post first, and then the next day or a day late, two days later, the uh, email list in order to just kind of stagger things a little bit. Those are my two biggest things. I get very few sales from Twitter, even though, like Joe, that's probably my most active platform. Um, and then I get a lot of sales. I just that are I, I'm not sure. You know, there are a little a few trickle in from Amazon advertising. Um, I few I'll get a few little boost if I'm able to do like you read your news today or, or um, I think Book Bar Book Barbarian may do new releases. I'll have to check. It's been a while now since I launched a brand new series. Um, so I'll get a few there, a few there. A lot of them I think just come from people that aren't on my list or or read the paper read the email a week later uh going in and buying the books i assume some is if you are able to keep in the top 100 for your categories that uh, some are just organic people finding you but i think it's a lot of people who maybe read me before but aren't super fans that are on the, the list and following the twitter and the facebook and all that but definitely the mailing list is uh, the biggest bang for the buck especially since that cost me nothing other than whatever $20 a month that I pay to maintain the list. Everything else, especially Amazon ads and Facebook ads and the like, costs, can cost you thousands of dollars, depending on what your budget is and how much you spend. All right. Jeffy, who was a guest just the other week, asks um, or says, on one of the shows, someone mentioned that a short pre-order lead has less impact on the spike and decline than a long one. Can you guys talk about that? Oh, and let me add this. Uh, this was a tweet she sent. And then Pippa DaCosta, who also writes science fiction, um, she replied on Twitter that long pre-orders equal a better run for subsequent books in the series. Short pre-orders pre equal good rank bump slash visibility. So good for our first book in a series. What do you, have you guys played around with the longer pre-orders much to have uh, experience with that? I have done a fair number of long pre-orders and a couple of short ones. Uh, I don't, oddly enough, I'm usually not too worried about hitting a giant peak with my releases, mostly because my releases are, for the last few years, have been late series releases, so they're not going to have a huge hit, except from fans of the series. But yeah, the long pre-orders, particularly in my experience on Barnes & Noble and iBooks, uh, have a major uh, rank impact because uh, when you when all the pre-orders are applied on the release day, uh, the rank, it's as though they were all purchases on release day. So you get a gigantic spike on that day. Uh, that, that at least was the case for the last couple of long pre-orders I did. I don't know if that changes. So that's like on, on other stores, it's really good. Amazon, that's not the case. During Amazon pre-orders, your ranking is changing with each pre-order as though the purchase was happening then. So since right around announcements is when the largest number of sales come in, uh, if you have a long pre-order period, then all of the pre-orders that are coming in are uh, sort of spreading out the impact that would have been there on launch day if you hadn't had a long pre-order. So since they're not compounding for the rank on release day, it sort of cannibalizes your rank if you have a long pre-order on Amazon. That said, you're still making all the money off of those sales. You're just not getting the, the rank off of those sales. So it's really up to you. 
Yeah, I've, I've noticed that. I've had a couple where I've done it on Smashwords, a couple on longer ones on Amazon, and it's the same thing where you know, usually when I, I know how much the sales jump when you know, the, on the day of release. Amazon, for me, it's, it's better if I don't do the pre-order just because everything gets hit at the same time and it looks better in the rankings. Um, uh, also, but for the Smashwords, yeah, Barnes & Noble, iBook, Kobo, they all seem to really like the long pre-orders. So I haven't really done too many pre-orders. But the ones that I do, I'll do it. I'll actually do it through Smashwords, which handles all the retailers, except for Amazon. Yeah, no, nothing against you guys, Amazon. All right, I've only done long pre-orders on books like this Chains of Honor book three that I just released. I think I had the pre-order for four or five months uh, because even uh, at least it was not on Amazon. It was only up for about a month, but because uh, I didn't have the manuscript, and I think Smashwords and the other sites will let you do the empty asset list pre-order, I think is what they call it. Uh, Kobo and those guys are cool with that. Amazon is not. And I'm always afraid if I put up some BS file, that's like the last book or something that that will be the thing that goes out because I, it happens just often enough from the horror stories I hear from people that I, the early, the, the, the most unpolished thing I'll put out is my typo hunter copy I'll put up there, uh, which, you know, will still have some word flubs in it, but basically the manuscript is complete. Nobody would feel, cheated or they wouldn't be hysterics if they got the wrong book so that's another reason i don't haven't tried the long pre-orders that much because when i have something done i'm about ready to release it but um we'll see with my next sci-fi series maybe i'll put it up for more like three four weeks for book one and just not doing anything so maybe like i said run five dollar and ams ads a day on it but um, the people I saw that um, with bigger audiences that said they were doing well, uh, one of the things they mentioned is that you will basically get two new release emails sent out from Amazon to uh, whoever has followed you on Amazon. Uh, hopefully, uh, Amazon's a little unpredictable with these. I've got in my mind, you know, like this last year or so, I've been pretty good about sending them out for my stuff. I follow myself so I can see that. Um, but like they got a new release email sent out when the pre-order went up within a couple weeks and then they got another one sent out when the release went out but if you only had your pre-order up for a week you probably would not get both and it's always you cannot assume people see you know like the first email especially if they get emails from amazon all the time so and um oh the last thing i was gonna mention if you want to get a <laughs> if you want to get the new york times bestseller list or something if you are that kind of person that has the potential to do that a long pre-order is going to be way better for that because that, everything dumps the first week so if you think you have a shot of um getting like ten thousand sales or even uh sometimes it's only like seven sixty five hundred seven thousand to make the usa today list that like I would definitely do a long pre-order if I was shooting for that. Um, but I haven't released a new series wide for quite a while. So that's uh, as long as you're exclusive to Amazon, that is not a possibility. You have to be wide. You have to get reports from multiple retailers to make those lists. All right. Okay. Next question is from MJ. I've decided to try using some boosted posts from my Facebook page instead of running ads. I've turned off my ads and will instead run the same amount of money per day over a week and see what happens. Have any of you tried boosted posts only for advertisements? Um, in terms of Facebook, with the exception of a couple of experiments, which I'm hoping to expand uh, as I you know, start to hone my skills. I've only really ever used face, uh, boosted posts. Uh, I don't have a regular campaign of them. I just, when I have I, a periodic boost to get the ball rolling on releases, basically. So a new release email, or maybe if I have like an audio book come out for an older book, just basically a new product, sometimes I'll boost a, a, a post. Uh, so, I mean, they're effective, but again, I've never used a campaign, so I really don't know daily sales how they do. As for me personally, I have not ever used a boosted post. The uh, advertising I've done with Facebook has just been normal campaigns on it. And I will even, even then it's been a little while, so can't help you there, unfortunately. All right. It's probably been about a year since I ran a campaign and like actually set up ad copy and, and tried to like say, here's how much I'm going to bid and um, doing it that way. So, and I feel like the people who are really good at Facebook ads uh, that we've had on the show would kind of cringe at the idea of advertising a boosted post or only doing that. But honestly, that's what I do most of the time because it's, it's quick and easy and I get a whole lot of organic interaction on my Facebook 
to my author page posts. So I'll often like throw the post out there for a couple of days and get a whole lot of comments. Like um, when I've had good results, I think I mentioned this the last time we did a Q and A show was when I've got something new that's, or that's going to be on sale for a while. Like um, right now my, I don't even know, Dragon Blood box set is coming up next for a book by bad. So I'm going to be dropping the part price on that. And when I've done that and I say, Hey guys, this is free in kind of one of my flagship series when the first box set is free. And if I post about that, I get a ton of readers that just say like, Oh yeah, these are awesome. You should check it out. Or I really enjoyed these. So I get all this nice organic interaction and then I boost the post and then I figure whoever sees it, whether the ad copy, I, I try to write a post that will work as ad copy basically. And isn't just totally uh, too fan only. Um, so, but uh, anyway, there's a lot of social proof already on the post once it's boosted. And so I've had good luck like that, but it's, you know, I don't think you can say what you're going to bid exactly. It's a little, there's fewer controls uh, when you're just saying, yep, boost this post and I'll spend this over this many days. So um, if you're really into the Facebook ads, the campaigns, I think, give you a little more control, but I think the boosted posts, they work pretty well for me for what they are. I, I maybe do like one a month when I have something like that. Yeah, I don't usually do them on new release, to be honest, because I, I don't get that huge social proof from the fans because they haven't read them yet. So I, I wait till I have a sale or somebody can get it for free. Um, I, I love promoting my free stuff because it's worked so well for me. Um, I know people read, especially with the box sets, they read those three books and they're ready to buy the next five. Alrighty. Blair says, I'm planning to write both standalones and series books. Is it, a, is it better to take your standalones wide to help establish yourself in those markets, or am I better off leaving my standalones, standalones in KU? Um, I like wide for everything uh, so far, uh, but that's because I haven't had a whole lot of experience in KU. Oddly enough, I've only ever done standalones in KU, so backwards. But I'd say that a standalone book is tricky enough to market anyway, uh, and a lot of the stuff that you get from KU is really more useful for a series. So if you'd like to take a book wide, I, probably a standalone isn't a bad idea. You're not going to lose a lot of the KU impact, and it's definitely useful to have a presence wide, just just you know to cover your bases and, and not have to depend entirely on Amazon. As for me. I always prefer going wide. I like appealing to as great an audience as possible. The last thing I'd ever want to do is limit your readership. Of course, people might know my difficulties with the great big A, so I can't say too much about them, but I'd like the sales and income they, they bring in, but I do not ever want to limit myself. To, I've tried KU once, didn't work out well for me. So for me, it's always going to be wide. If this was me, I probably wouldn't bother. I think you're gonna have a really hard time selling the standalones in the wide, especially if your focus is kind of split and you're trying to do Amazon for the most part and then you're just sticking that stuff out there to have a presence. Nobody's gonna find you if you don't advertise them. And it, the same stuff that works on Amazon, the series, the rapid release, you know, or at least publishing regularly in the series is what's gonna help on the other sites too. It's just tough all around with standalones. So, I would probably just, honestly, if it was me and I had my series in KU, I'd put the standalones in KU too, uh, in order to hopefully get some extra page reads. If you sell enough with your series, you never know when those page reads might help push you over to get a, a bonus or something. And um, I just I just think it's going to be hard to make much headway with the standalones. But if you try it and uh, you're successful, if you're willing to advertise the standalones, you know, if you're selling it like maybe $4.99 or something and it's worth it to advertise it, um, that could be a possibility, but I, I feel like series are kind of what make the rabid fans and what really uh, give you some tricks up your sleeve, like a perma free book one in order to get people to buy the later one. So it, it's a tough road either way with the standalones. Okay, Mendy asks, hey guys, I've been listening forever and realized a topic that you haven't covered. So I'm writing my first epic fantasy series, but it's tough going with working and severe health issues, but I dream of going full-time. How do you guys handle healthcare without an employer? And before we go, we are all in the U.S., so this is only going to be our experience in the U.S. Uh, yeah, uh, I purchased my own healthcare uh, through the healthcare marketplace, so Obamacare. I make enough money that it's not subsidized at all, but it was still just a good way to comparison shop. Uh, it's pricey, uh, I'm not going to lie, but uh, it's what I have to do. 
Uh, you could also always do what Annie Bolette did, which is move to Europe. <laughs> so that's that's how she handled her health her healthcare problems. But yeah, as it is right now, I'm just I'm just buying mine. Yeah, I, I did the same thing. I looked at uh, the, the Obamacare is it to see how much the health insurance would cost me. It was actually mo- it was actually more than what we would pay just to have me added to my wife's policy. So for me, it was easy. I'm on my wife's. I have a friend with type one diabetes who cannot just move to Canada or someplace else. Like if you have an existing health condition, condition, you may have limited options for countries you can move to. Um, But uh, I am the same way you can buy. There's actually a lot of options out there if you're because being self-employed and or freelancer, a lot of people that applies to a lot of people. So it's just one of those things like mine's like $400 a month. I'm not as young as I used to be. So it's gotten more expensive and I have a couple prescriptions I'm on. So it's not the cheapest one. Um, but that's just something you're going to have to factor for if you do decide to go full time. And that's with any, anybody that's self-employed, you just, you pay a little extra in taxes because you're not, you don't have a boss that's covering the and this is again in the U.S. The uh, FICA Medicare stuff, that half that they cover usually, and you don't have anybody paying for your health insurance. But there are things out there you can buy, even if you have issues. Um, you can usually, if you pay enough, they'll cover you. Um, U.S. is not the easiest place. There are definitely countries where you're just going to be covered because you're a citizen. So um, just gotta put a, make sure you're making more than you made basically than when you were working for someone else, so that you can cover those extras. All right, Sarah asks, how did you find a good editor and what did you try to do? No, what did you do to try them out to decide if they were the one? Um, I, well, I ended up, I have had three editors over the course of my, my time and I'll just go through them quickly. Uh, Claudette Cruz uh, was a fan of mine who offered her services at a discount. Actually, he offered them for free, but I, I paid her. Uh, she did excellent work, but I never used her as a, standard go-to editor she was usually uh for shorter stuff or for last minute stuff uh there used to be a site called editors and predators i don't i think it's changed hands right now i I, it it might be back up but for a while it was down and it was just a place where they would they would rate editors and publishers and agents and stuff like that and on there i found anna genoese and she was able to do a, a sample uh chapter for me i thought she did a good job so i used her a great deal i still use her quite frequently uh, and then I had, uh, I was actually in a contest. I was in a sci-fi contest. Uh, one of the only things I tried to get an award. I was a finalist along with someone named Tammy Salyer, who we've had on the show. And uh, I found out that she was an editor and Anna Genoese was unavailable uh, at a time when I needed an edit done. So I gave Tammy a try and she did a fantastic job. So now I use the two of those. Uh, so I guess my, the short version of my answer is I discovered my editors organically. Uh, but there used to be a tool called Editors and Predators. Uh, as for me, I've used several. The easiest way I've found to find a decent editor, and most of them will offer this, is you know, send them a chapter, and then usually we'll give you a preview of the type of work that they'll do. So what I did is I actually came, a, came up with a, probably one of my more difficult chapters, you know, full of you know, made-up names and you know, heavy on fantasy elements, that sort of thing, and uh, those that actually responded back and did a really good job with it. Those are the ones I decided to go ahead and give them a try. And if I like what I see, then I'll give them a chance. In my case, I had two editors for my first book who did not work out. Uh, first person was an English teacher. This is never a good <laughs> way to go. Um, not that English teachers can't be good editors, but it's a different profession, really. You want somebody that knows the Chicago Manual style backwards and forwards and is used to editing for a living, ideally. Um, the English teacher thing can work if you're on a budget and it's a friend of a friend, but I had a really bad experience. <laughs> so I was kind of like, where is this guy? An English teacher It cannot be in any country where standard stuff is used. So I found my third person and I've kept her for many, 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 many books now. And it's just a, a matter of um, how, how do you find if they're the one, you know, you work with them for a project and if it was satisfying on both sides, you can keep working with them. Uh, I like Jeff said, most editors will do a sample edit of a chapter. They may charge $25 or something and then put that towards the cost of the full edit if you go forward. Um, that's pretty common practice. Be a little nervous if you find somebody that won't do that. Um, 
and you can see from that, like, are they being overly picky? You know, are you disagreeing a lot with what they're saying? And make sure you look up what to, <laughs> don't just assume you know, and that you really have a strong background in that. I often am like, oh man, that can't be right. And I'll Google it <laughs> before I say something. Cause I'm like, oh, well, sometimes I was wrong. So that's kind of um, just, it's a little bit trial and error. Sometimes you get lucky. Um, I know Reedsy has a marketplace. I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, that they list a lot of professional editors. I think they're going to be a little higher priced folks in general, um, or, you know, because it's what they do for a living. It's not like a side hustle. And so they actually need to be paid a decent amount. I have certainly heard of indie authors finding folks that work for less. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's about it on that. Oh, Jonathan was also wondering about the best ways to find an editor specifically for science fiction, such as space opera. And, um, I guess my question is, do you want a developmental editor, somebody that's going to actually analyze the story, tell you your characters are weak, your plot has holes in it, you know, or do you just want somebody that's going to copy edit and make sure all the sentences are grammatically correct and seem to make sense on the sentence level? Because you don't need a sci-fi person for that. Um, if you want a developmental editor, I've heard that I've never done this because I do I have beta readers and before that I workshopped my stuff online for the first couple novels. So they got all kinds of feedback from uh, other writers who are some of the hardest critics. But I've heard that uh, you can often find the editors that the traditional publishers are using. Um, a lot of these folks, I guess they are freelance to traditional publishing or they just do stuff on the side. So if you maybe like find some of your favorite books, you know, that are, you think are well edited, whether indie or trap, but um, in, in that specific genre, and then try to find out who the main editor was, that may require some digging. Sometimes people put them in their acknowledgements, sometimes not. So that's a possibility. I'd be kind of wary about hiring a developmental editor who doesn't have that background and a, a good track record because you're talking thousands of dollars usually for that kind of edit um, whereas a copy edit for you know, like a hundred thousand words might be a thousand dollars or like I said even less if you find somebody that it's not their full-time thing so do you oh do you guys have any thoughts on um, genre specific stuff um I, I, I mean, usually an editor, uh, well, I don't usually, my, my editors frequently will have a list of, of, of uh, either their specialties or literally other books that they've edited, which also might be another good way for you to find uh, an editor that you like is if you like the books that they've edited. Uh, so, I mean, if you, yeah, if it's developmental, they'll often make it clear that that's one of their specialties. But uh, broadly speaking, I almost never do developmental editing. I've done it exactly once. So, the it, my stuff as long as they can have a clean sentence that's all i really care about so there's not a huge amount of differentiation beyond actually developing story yeah i've never used a develop, developmental editor as well so i wouldn't be the one to ask I, i'm with joe as long as they the uh copyright editor can make it look nice and clean for me that's good enough for me all right next question is from ian Agen. He asked, do we have any thoughts about ReadC Discovery? Speaking of ReadC, this is a service where you pay a fee and get potentially tons of reviews and exposure on their platform. It looks good for exposure. And I wasn't really aware of this yet. I think I'm on ReadC's mailing list, so it's probably passed by, but I think it's fairly recent. I looked on the page. Did you guys look it up? It looks like you pay $50 and they list you and maybe you get reviews <laughs> uh, and sent out to their people on their mailing list. And I looked into it very briefly, and it, it, it seems it's probably somewhat similar to like, you know, NetGalley or something like that, where you're making your book available to a group of people who, who are reviewers. I've never been one for paying for reviews, um, so I, I probably wouldn't use it. Not, I'm not recommending that you don't. I'm just, in my personal, the way I do things, I probably wouldn't uh, uh, use a service like this. So, and I've never, since I haven't used it, I certainly can't tell you how it goes. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've had similar type of things where people have sent me emails and whatnot and said, oh yeah, yeah you see that you got a book that's released and, you know, for X amount of dollars, we'll go ahead and give you, you know, we'll make sure you get those positive reviews. I'm with Joe. I, I don't advocate anybody paying for a review. To me, it's just, it, it loses the credibility if you do something like that. So I, I just absolutely refuse. 
I don't know enough about this to uh, really give an intelligent opinion. Um, it looks like it's more for dis as much for discovery as for getting reviews. And I think the reviews are go onto their marketplace rather than being posted on Amazon. So I'm not sure it's quite the same as paid reviews. Um, I may, I'll look into it when I have my next series launch. I'm always looking for sites where I can get promoted um, without, before you have reviews, you know, before you're running a sale. Uh, just on a new release because I, I did the the book bub one their new release thing announcement last uh, August when they first started it and that did not pan out for me and it was like four hundred and twenty dollars or something so I'm, I'm willing to throw fifty dollars at something just to see what happens um, less less for the reviews in my case and more just like oh if it's another place I can have an announcement come out about a new book hey I'll give it a try but um, yeah we can if any of us hear more about it later, we can bring it up again, or if we try it and if it actually moves the dial. Or if anybody here has used it already and wants to leave a comment in the show notes for this episode, uh, we would certainly accept that. I don't know what episode number this is, guys. Let me check. Okay, it's going to be 222 on marketingsff.com. All righty. Uh, now, he has a second question, too. If your book has reviews in the non-U.S. Amazon stores, is there a way to merge them all to the U.S. store since it's the, the exact same book? And the answer is no. <laughs> no. Oddly enough, it does work in reverse. Uh, frequently, you can go to a non-Amazon U.S. store, and it will have all of the reviews from Amazon.com, but it doesn't work the other way. I've noticed that's only until you get your first review in that store. Because I've oh, seen yeah. Canada, that happens to me a lot because it's such a small store. It will take longer before I start getting reviews from there. I'll be like, oh, I have eight reviews there. And it's like, oh, no, it's the .com reviews that they brought over. But, if um, if you are the kind of person who gets lots of international reviews, I suppose you could always try to direct people to Goodreads where, you know, or any other uh, platform agnostic uh, review site. Uh, I think library thing is probably still a thing, but uh, those those are places where you can you can gather reviews from all over the place and not have to worry about where they came from. I guess just yeah, I don't be happy have anything that you're getting to this elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. No, I was just saying I don't really have anything else to add to this one either. You're pretty much at Amazon's mercy. All right. And Diana, next question has, uh, Diana says, what are the most surprising slash unlikely income streams you've developed in your writing career? Uh, in my case, it was the translations. Uh, I have got translations in a lot of different languages now. And I hadn't realized just how valuable that income was because it's irregular. It's, it's basically traditionally published, which means I get paid on like quarters. And actually, I get paid whenever I across a certain threshold, which usually takes about two months. But I was prepping for my taxes this year and I went through all my 1099s and found that my, my record keeping and the 1099s were, were off by like a five figure number. And I was confused as to where that extra money was. And then I realized it was all from the German translation. I, I'd, I'd made over $10,000 on the German translation. So I was very surprised considering particularly uh, I'd never actually pursued translation. They, they approached me. And the other one that surprises me is uh, Patreon. I don't make a lot of money off of Patreon, but I expected to make zero dollars off of Patreon. So <laughs> the fact that I have a, a steady monthly income from Patreon is impressive to me. As for me, mine was with the audiobooks. I kick myself in the butt every time I think about it because I waited so long to get on that particular train. And now that I'm on it, you know, money just keeps coming in. I've and I just have, you know, I have more and more demand for more titles. And I just keep converting more of them over. So that would be, that would be it for me. If, you, if your books are selling well, try and get them over to the audiobooks because that's just more money in your pocket. I don't think I have anything that was unlikely or surprising that's come up uh, for my fiction in the years I've been doing this. Uh, I make much more on the ebooks, and that's kind of what I expected since the royalties are high. And I'm... Um, they, I can sell them inexpensively and still make good money on each sale. I, I certainly make money from audiobooks. I never had a translation that uh, sold <laughs> well. And um, I would say the only surprising income that was pretty awesome was when I used to do nonfiction. Man, this is a long time ago. I don't know if you can still make as much, but I used to make a lot from Google AdSense on my 
moderately trafficked blogs on home improvement. <laughs> and I had a site on swimming pools for a while that was making like 5,000 a month back in like 2004. Um, so it was, it was crazy at the time. And that was partially being in there kind of early and putting together a good content before there was zillions of content sites out there and um, jumping on AdSense right away when it came out. So I'm pretty sure it's still out there. I have no idea who's making what now with it since I've shifted entirely over to my fiction at this point. Okay, Jane asks or says, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the building and usefulness of Facebook pages and reader groups. Um, for me, I get most of my best, like in terms of usefulness, I get most of my best fan interactions uh, and feedback on Facebook. Uh, I built it entirely organically. I, I have links in my, uh, I have, a, I have a, a ribbon at the bottom of each of my newsletters that has all the social media places there are. And up until very recently, I had specific links in the back matter to all of my social media things. And that's how I got everybody onto my uh, Facebook fan page. It's not a huge fan page, but again, it's all organic. So all the activity there is genuine. Um, as for the, the uh, uh, reader groups, I have a couple of reader groups that I have refined from the regular fan page and from the newsletters. And they're very great for organizing and talking to fans and distributing files because basically everyone is on Facebook. Uh, so yeah, that's where I am with pages and reader groups. That's yes. For me, I've met and friended quite a few fans on Facebook. I have my own private group for fans, readers, which I refer to as my posse. If that's the ones that will help me you know, come up with you know, character names if I need it or just possible suggestions. Anytime I ever have a problem with the book or I need any advice, I can just throw a question out there. And typically less than five minutes, I've got a minimum of 10, 15 different answers. Just all offering suggestions. So it works out quite well for me. For myself, I only briefly sort of had, I guess what you would call a reader group is actually how I was managing an ARC team, which I only did for a year or less. It was enough of a moderation hassle that it really kind of turned me off of starting any other groups and I dissolved it eventually. Um, I've certainly seen authors that are really into it and really love it. And I think I, I'm a member of some of the big genre ones that have grown to like 500 or a thousand readers. And, um, you know, it, it becomes a lot more than just the author plugging their own books. In fact, I hardly ever see that. It becomes like, here's what I'm reading, and then people share what they're reading, and um, I don't see anything wrong with that. I'm not sure how much you're going to get out of it for the time you're put into it, so I would only do it if it sounds like an awesome thing that you're excited to do. I mean, you know, want to share and get together with other people who are interested in my stuff and other stuff in my genre that I love. So... Um, as far as having a Facebook author page, I would uh, definitely do this. Uh, as I said, this is my number two after the mailing list. I, I think I've got 8,000 some follow or likes, whatever right now. And I've never, I, I almost never even remember to mention that I have a Facebook page on the end of my books. So I, I think I'm trying to do it a little more going forward. But um, so those are pretty organic and they're pretty, I have a pretty good, um, I don't know, I get pretty good engagement on my post. Uh, having, you know, tried to post regularly, especially since last summer, I got a little more into it, really trying to uh, ask questions and um, get people involved. And it, it's been, considering it really only takes me maybe five minutes a week to find a couple of dragon cookies or dragon ice sculptures or, you know, hey, say, hey, this is what I'm reading now. What are you guys reading? It's been a pretty good return on my investment in that uh, term. And since so many people are on Facebook, and if you're selling it all, people, they're going to be looking for you on Facebook. So if you don't have one, that's kind of a lost opportunity. All right. Quinn asks kind of a craft question. Uh, where do you start in your character creation? All right. I've, as is the case with almost everything, it, you know, craft related, I have done this uh, a number of different ways. Uh, it depends. I will write character driven stories sometimes. Uh, this is normally when I have like an ensemble cast. And in those cases, I'll start with what personalities I think are necessary. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a specific example. Uh, Free Wrench was a character driven story. Uh, and I, it's, it's, it's about the crew of an airship. So I started off by having here are the positions that are necessary for that crew. And then I would pick what interactions I wanted between them and what kind of personalities I wanted them to have. I ended up combining characters to get the cast smaller because I want it to be a shorter book overall. 
so yeah, mostly w w when I'm doing a character-driven thing, that's what I'll do is just have characters and personalities and then build backstories off of them and then determine what kind of adventure those characters would have. When I'm doing a, a when I have a strong premise that I start with, what I will do is basically the characters are built around who is necessary to make that story happen. So to sort of metaphorize it, uh, characters are like dots and the story is like lines. So if it's character driven, I start with dots and then find the lines that will connect them. And when it is story driven, I will find the places where the lines cross and put a dot there. So <laughs> there's, that's what I do. So graphical. <laughs> Me and mine was much, much more uh, basic. Uh, I typically have already figured out the basic plot of the book. My process is to add some humor to lighten up. So I start imagining which type of characters would have the most interesting interactions. Usually throw in a pinch of first-hand experiences, whether good or bad, and voila, instant characters. I will also mention that I jot down the personality, appearances, quirks, etc. of each character in my notebook because it makes it easy to reference back. And I can't tell you how many times I've forgotten you know, who I based the character off of. And, and you lose the flow as you're writing. And most of them, more often than not, it yanks me out of the zone. And I end up swearing like a sailor. So for me, <laughs> I've hit that age, unfortunately, when I've got to jot crap down or else I flat out forget about it. So that's me. I am definitely someone who writes character-driven stories. I have occasionally had the plot idea first, and it's not that that can't work for me, but almost better, I think I get, I get, almost always I get better stories if the character's what comes to me first. And it's usually the main character, or maybe there's two main characters if there's gonna be a romance thread. And then the other characters in the plot, I figure out along the way, but the, the central character will kind of be a fulcrum and what's going on with him affects everything else for a whole series. Uh, for example, like my Fallen Empire story, it's the story of a mom who was a pilot and fought in a war and then the war's over and she finds out that her husband died and her daughter is missing. So the whole premise of the eight book series is she's, she has to find her daughter. And so that becomes basically the core plot of it. And you know, there's lots of side stories and stuff that go on along the way, but for me, I, I think just having a character who has some major issues that they have to resolve makes for very interesting reading, whether you're doing mysteries or sci-fi or thrillers, you know, if uh, the reader doesn't have a reason to really care about and connect with that character, you just kind of lose them with book one. You, it's only going to be some hardcore folks that are going to keep reading for no reason. So I, I, for me, that's the most important thing. Like I feel as a reader myself, I'll go almost anywhere with you on the plot as long as it's not too boring um, if I really enjoy the character. All right, we've been talking for about an hour and we still have a lot of questions left. So we're gonna go ahead and break it there and pick up next week talking about audiobook marketing or it might be two weeks. Uh, I was out of town last week and it looks like Jeff's gonna be out of town next week. So we uh, might not have a show next week, but um, we will get back with the second half of these when we are able. And I really thank you very much for listening. Do you guys have anything in parting you want to say? Uh, not really. Just say, Dave, thanks for listening and uh, take it easy. Yep. No, I, I think I covered it all at the top. So, yep. Just thanks for everything. All right. Cool. And this was, as I said, episode 222 at marketingsff.com. If you want to come and comment or chime in on any, if you've used the, was it Rezi Discovery or anything else that we talked about and uh, want to let people know come on in and we'd love to have you. Uh, thanks for listening. Everyone have a good week. So long everybody. See you later.